business. Um, of making people's proudest moments. Sport is about making people's proudest moments. This topic uh, today that I'm going to be covering um, means different things to different people. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard the term sport washing, but I get an uh, indication of hands, a few. And I'm sure it may, if I talk to each of you individually, it may mean different things <laughs> to each of you. Um, but looking at this, there's also all types of different washing. Uh, there's pink washing, rainbow washing, woke washing, uh, white washing, um, blue washing, green washing, and just about every type of washing that you can imagine. Um, what I'm going to attempt to do today is to give you an overview of where I think sport washing uh, lands and sits, what it really is. Uh, hopefully be a bit provocative in terms of how we do it, um, and then also from a human rights perspective, um, which is one of the perspectives of dealing with uh, sport washing, um, is maybe give us uh, something to think about in terms of a framework and how we can tackle sport washing. And I'll leave you with a few uh, next steps or recommendations that I think we need to address as sport, and then hopefully take some very loaded and good questions from all of you. So, thank you. So the backdrop that we're, we're really working under right now, um, you know, in terms of the world of sport, is one where social media, digital connectivity, consumer activism, and purpose-led corporate strategies are around us. Um, they're really dictating how we consume, how we connect, um, how we you know, think about our daily lives, how we identify our sense of being, our sense of belonging, are all impacted by that first bullet point. We have global reckonings and social and historical inequality and injustices being debated and lots of discourse out there across the world on these, on these points. Geopolitics, identity politics, and plenty of conflict um, is, is around us. We have huge debates and proclamations and declarations around our values and how they conflict with other values our philosophies, the cultural norms, and sport, obviously, is in the middle of all of this. Contrasting stakeholder and shareholder interests, you know, you have the emergence of debates around shareholder versus stakeholder capitalism, and how that plays out in various fields and industries. And then finally, you have this ever-evolving and developing area of standard setting on issues around ethics, integrity, accountability, transparency, and compliance. Now, with that backdrop, we look at the definition of sport washing. So keeping all those points in mind, that complexity of the world that we are trying to deliver day-to-day -day sport and major sporting events, how can sport be either used as a force for good or as a force for harm or self-interest? And so in looking at this definition of sport washing, there was no real clear definition. Uh, it really started to emerge around 2016. There was huge debates and it started to kind of main, mainstream headlines. And what I was able to kind of ascertain with it, and, I'm willing to be challenged on this, definitely, but this was my first take at the words that were coming out around sport washing. And it was an element, firstly, of there was deliberate intent. And these are the words, these are not my words, these are words that uh, I found in a number of articles and, and research papers discussing sport washing. Deceit, deceptiveness, insincere, opportunistic, and exploited deliberate intent to use sport, so to effectively use sport and the social license that it gives us, the positive social license it gives us to engage with people and communities, the value generation potential, its scalability, the ability to go locally as well as globally, to use it for game, to use it for game, and that's whether to improve our reputation, to legitimize our power, establish control, leverage influence, and or reap benefits. So all of that, you know, 
the intent behind that, you know, whether you do that openly, you do that closed, I think is really important. However, the last point down at the bottom is that there is a consciousness in the realm of sport washing, which is willfully and knowingly being complicit and or directly or indirectly engaged in causing harm. And I think this is where sport washing really starts to become interesting and, and really goes beyond, I would say, what we assume are the usual suspects. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. But different areas uh, that can be backed up by this notion of sport washing are political oppression and geopolitical aggression, human rights violations and abuse, environmental degradation, so there's an environmental element, obviously, not just a, a social element, corruption and criminality, and discrimination, inequality, and injustice. So if we subscribe to this as a working definition of sports washing, who does it apply to? I'm not sure how well you can read this, but uh, this is a map of an ecosystem. And at the Center for Sport and Human Rights, we decided to look at uh, the world of sport not in the traditional institutional hierarchical constructs, but more of an organic ecosystem of institutions and individuals, people and agencies, if you will, or actors, that have relationships, indirect and direct relationships. They work together. And essentially, their actions impact each and every one, every group uh, that is involved or part um, of this ecosystem. So if we look at it in the stadium context, if players and racial abuse are being screamed in one, in one section by one actor group, it affects the whole atmosphere. If, a, if the wave is started by one group and it affects everyone, I don't use the word violently anymore, but affects everyone around the stadium in a positive atmosphere, affects everyone. The same with sport motion. But we essentially, what we did was we made a people-centric and with the roles that people play in sport, obviously athletes being in the middle. Some characteristics of their vulnerable groups around us because we are a human rights agency. And then identify the different actor groups into 10 actor groups and a series of uh, seating walks in terms of their uh, sub-actor groups to really showcase who's involved in sport. And we need to get everyone into the tent um, or everyone into the, the arena. So everyone's affected when sport washing happens. Whether it's happening in your events or not, there is this uh, association with the fact that you're part of the sport ecosystem, that people will question both your intent and your competency. So some of the risk areas it affects are you know, sport events, obviously, uh, organizing you know, the appropriateness or the fit of a host city or nation, how a sport movement promotes itself and develops itself. Is it living to its values when it's making certain decisions. Uh, sport body governance and management, how does it actually do its business? Um, due diligence comes into account here. Uh, private ownership, investment schemes, investing in sport. What is their intention behind their investment? Is it transparent? What are the, the standards of accountability that are being used to assess whether and what, where that money uh, is coming from? And is it essentially blood money or clean money. Sports sponsorship and suppliers are obviously impacted by sport washing, by their association, but they also can contribute to some of the challenges, both from their historical actions or their current actions. And again, um, you look at the example of Dow Chemical and the impact that that had, and there was, there was claims of Dow Chemical being um, you know, conducting a sport washing exercise in its association with the Olympics. And it really never recovered as a, a top sponsor in that, in that area. 
um, even though it had been making uh, enormous uh, remedial action around some of its past occurrences. Um, so that's, a, that's one that's really uh, you know, quite, I think, pertinent. And you, of course, saw around Beijing 2008, uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games, uh, American top sponsors being brought forward in front of Congress to be held to account in terms of their support um, of the games. And so this is a real aspect in terms of risk around uh, the reputation of who essentially the company, the company would keep. Sport philanthropy, again, where's the money coming from? Um, and is it being used to essentially wash uh, money through the system in, in terms of sport development activities and so forth? That is an emerging area of sport washing. washing. And then, of course, again, being judged with the company you keep, how athletes, teams, clubs are endorsed, um, whether that is them endorsing certain products or certain groups, or, being, uh, or them being endorsed, and their own actions. So we have a, a number of uh, players that are involved with, uh, that have been given sponsorships and, and put on teams that have very dubious backgrounds in terms of uh, gender-based violence and, and so forth, is that a form of sport culture? And so I think, again, maybe not a definitive answer, but certainly some interesting questions to start asking ourselves as this area starts to emerge. Considerations, I think, are really important. Is that this really started as very much a Western view of other places of the, uh, in, in, in the realm. Um, and really looking at, well, they're hosting these events for, not necessarily for good, but for bad. And so most of the media has looked at this. But there's, I think, context is quite important. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, my time with the Commonwealth Games. And I think it's important to, to kind of recognize that where we are today is not where we were even 10 years ago, much less nine years ago. But I think it's an important point of reflection is that context evolves. Um, and context is an important consideration when we look at issues and questions around sport washing. Interests, interests are often not declared. And I think that's one of the areas that when we're looking at uh, hosting major events or uh, conducting sponsorships, really getting the true interests out there. Cultural nuances and differences and true evaluation of the impact of these events and being held to account to all these principles. So these are all considerations that when we look at sport washing, we can kind of evaluate where the gaps, where the holes, where issues are silent on, and have we really considered the total picture? I mentioned the Commonwealth Games. You know, there has been an enormous reckoning over the past several years on big issues around empire, colonialism, uh, issues around slavery, and, and all of these points. Uh, the entire um, debate on the advocacy and rights of LGBT community, as, as an example. If these questions are not addressed up front and as a part of a broader conversation that is associated with a, a brand, then you risk being accused of sport washing and using, using the glamour and beauty of sport and that social license as a facade to create. And so there's elements there that I think are really, really important that, uh, for us to also reflect in kind of the Western world. You saw uh, recently in the States last year, uh, Major League Baseball pulled one of its games because of the voter suppression laws uh, going through in Georgia. Uh, so they pulled their major, um, one of their major uh, tournaments, I think it was the All-Star game, out of Atlanta. Uh, in fear of being seen as complicit um, and afraid of sport washing and endorsing, legitimizing some of the activity that was going on. So it's this notion of being judged with the company to keep them their intentions 
behind hosting events, and also the values that you seek to uphold are quite important. It's a high stakes game, and this was something that kind of came to me as I was looking at this, is that as we approach this work, there we can do short-term short gains with long-term gains, so we can go, go for gold without really thinking it through um, and suffer in terms of our brand and our opportunities for, for many years to come and try to recover from that. Um, and we can also take short-term gains and have difficult conversations uh, or take big risks. Uh, and sometimes they pay off, uh, and sometimes they don't. So this is really a question, I think, on both sides, you know, whether you're uh, trying to sport wash or trying to prevent sport washing. These two kind of questions come to mind in terms of what are the stakes at point. The several legal impacts, um, you know, I think we start to look at the implications, you know, of all the issues that have faced us on, on sport washing over the past several years. Is the world of sport and that actor group, those 10 actors, were they ready to deal with the government governance implications of this conversation? Do their statutes, their codes, their policies, regulations, and rules, were they able to respond? Were there preventative measures in place to be able to deal with this? Management. Obviously, if it the governance, you know, this is more operational. Were there processes and procedures, delivery of service models, and resourcing that was robust enough not to be accused of sport washing? If we use uh, a supplier, as an example, that is using, uh, you know, um, is using material that has been given by slave labor or slave labor or uh, forced labor. You know, have we done our due diligence in the world of sport? And it, am I not doing it? Is that a form of sport washing? Competitions. Well, there's been plenty of hype around competitions. The majority of sport washing discussion has been around the competition arena. More importantly, of, uh, should this particular country or city have the right, right to host? But this really comes down to the awarding standards, the delivery regulations, the legacy standards that we establish in the contracts, in the processes, the feasibility the assessments, and also how we report on what are the ambitions of these projects, what are the risks of these projects, what are the mitigating plans of these projects, and how can we move forward. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, educational and development capacity building initiatives. Uh, again, how much are we helping to prevent this by educating people in terms of their leadership competencies and the overall culture of sport. And how much is it addressing these big systemic and salient issues that can lead to sport washing. And then of course brand, brand development, positioning, value generation of the social and commercial piece. You know, the, the, the whole element of sport washing talks to, you know, a, a misalignment of values. And, and really I think that that's, brands are built on strong values and bringing those values to life. Um, if you are found or accused of sport washing, your brand and your values are brought into question. So there's all types, and that has an effect on your supporters and your suppliers and your sponsors and people uh, or institutions that want to be associated with your movement, your games, your event. There's all types of political impact as well. So there's lots of People in the world of sport playing politics to avoid politics, um, you know, and, and, and making taking positions on uh, the, ap the apolitical positioning of sport. My argument to this is that the majority of major sport events, for example, and major sport movements, are funded <coughs> with some government funding. As soon as you engage in government funding, you're engaging with people. 
and you're engaging with communities, and you, you have a level of responsibility that you need to uphold. Um, so by its nature, it becomes politically interested. Calls for participation in sponsorship boycotts. Uh, you know, this is not new conversation. This is something that's been in, in the public discourse for some time. Protests, which is different than advocacy and activism. I think protests is very much against something versus standing for something. Um, and that's something that uh, I think is important to, to also consider that sport washing brings that particularly out to the, into the fray and into the, the situation and how we're not prepared in the world of sport to really deal with some of this nuance. Uh, there's an ongoing reluctance uh, to bid and host sport events as a result of some of the damage that has been done in terms of uh, you know, the alignment with the values and, and so forth. And so there's a, it's an increasingly competitive space um, and very, very difficult uh, to get your, your relevance and your proposition out there if it's been compromised by a sport washing incident. There's limitations on institutional autonomy and independence that comes from when we have uh, been associated with sport washing, people don't trust us, so they want to try to control the world of sport much closer, or um, alternatively, if it's been sport wash, certain influences have been able to gain traction um, in a particular movement, and that becomes incredibly difficult to, uh, to implement your autonomy um, and act independently. This also challenges individual rights to self-determination. So as this exercise is being conducted, it may not align with my values. Do I participate? Am I forced to participate in a place that I don't want to participate? Or I have a fundamental challenge in participating? And that is a real question of you know, the people's rights to self-determination. Have I, did I sign up for this in my sport? And also, obviously, the political impact of sport washing is the, it, it becomes a feeding ground for various ideological platform as well. So I'm going to take you, and I have a few minutes left and I'm going to speed through this quickly, is that one of the ways of trying to manage the situation is to establish frameworks. And from a human rights perspective, and there's other perspectives uh, that can concern uh, sport washing, for example, uh, the, the environmental aspect as well, is to use different frameworks. Uh, the Center for Sport and Human Rights, one of the things that we do is we use the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, and we've also established a series of principles that we call the Sporting Chance Principles. Essentially, uh, this standard framework, which uh, really sets out, uh, was uh, established by the United Nations in 2011, was there to really help companies and governments uh, in that wider kind of ecosystem uh, to understand and manage their risks. Um, and particularly, obviously, focused on, on human rights. And really what it starts out is a series of roles and duties in these different pillars. Uh, governments having the, uh, having the duty or responsibility to protect against human rights abuses, where pretty much everyone else <laughs> in the entire ecosystem, uh, you may have seen some of the color coding on that, on that, uh, on that map, is there to really respect uh, they need to respect human rights and really showcase that they're not doing harm. And that's really important to have. And number three is really the remedial action. And everyone has a responsibility to fix it if it's broken. And if it has created harm, is to deal with that harm and to make things right or to make things better. And so that framework really provides us, it starts off with making a commitment. Having every single actor group make a commitment to look through its lens and, and, and take on this responsibility. Engage stakeholders. Engage as many stakeholders in the dialogue on all those issues we listed and assess the impact, the balanced proposition of both risks and the opportunities it, that are available. Develop a strategy and plan of action based on that assessment, report and communicate, 
communication is key, and then remediate when harm has occurred. Very, very simple. The sporting chance principles essentially um, provide us with 10 aspects. I'm going to focus on the last one, which is very pertinent, which is bidding to host medic sport events should be open to everyone. Everyone should be able to host an event, even some of the questionable places that we have seen in our media that question the right is how we host and what we are able to do with that hosting opportunity to both mitigate and handle risks and prevent harms and make deliver on the promise of sport. We subscribe to the principle that we are here to create people's proudest moments. That it really does start at looking at our commitment to what that really means. And I think sport washing in many ways reflects this. Um, finally, four things I think we need to do in this space. We need to start embracing more of an ecosystem-based approach versus playing to hierarchical control constructs and look at our industry um, more holistically. We need to conduct uh, more due diligence and risk management needs to be very much part of our good governance and management uh, priorities in the world of sport. ESG is here, and we need to start looking at the integration, uh, the intersection of ESG in terms of place, people, and prosperity agenda. And then finally, leadership and culture. I think culture uh, is often described as the worst behavior <laughs> that we're willing to tolerate. And I really think, uh, I was talking with Richard um, just before this, I think we need to make a cultural shift to deal with and prevent issues of sport washing by ensuring that we have a culture in sport that upholds ethics, that with those ethics, we have good policies and procedures that ensure integrity and that we constantly seek for compliance and standard setting. And I think you know the, the world of uh, the legal realm has a lot to play um, in addressing all of these points. Thank you very much. Is a lot of by not 
having a conversation is not actually dealing with the issue. Um, so you know, the, the athletes, I think, you know, are put in a professional sport is a bit different because there's so much interest and so much stakes uh, in it, and it really is a more, I would say, a more balanced proposition in terms of uh, you know everyone is looking to gain in the situation. But as everyone, my question to, to, to the athletes would be, have you done your own due diligence? And what is your responsibility? You know, and if you're comfortable with that, then, then fine. Um, but what are you going to do to address the, the issues that are coming forward? And I think that that's a, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult one um, to put out there. Um, it, it's, but it's, you know, it's not blaming, I'm not saying it's the, the fault of the athletes, or the, but I do think the choice to go there is not one group's choice. It is, you know, it is uh, everyone's, uh, the, everyone in that ecosystem is getting on board. So everyone's accountable. And I think that that's the, that, that's the reminder that, that we really need to make for this is, you know, this is the world we live in today. People are going to ask questions and they're either going to praise you uh, indefinitely on, on Twitter or they're going to criticize you indefinitely for everyone to see for eternity. Uh, so it's a you know that's the risk you take now in this world. The world is fundamentally changed in this space. It does concern me because you mentioned Twitter there, and it does seem that that, that seems to be that the only place where, where people talk about this really on social media. And if that's the only punishment, they wait for that to die down and they go off to Qatar, to Saudi Arabia, to take their paycheck, and they're not too concerned. And the worrying part is that we, we all attend and you know, we criticise this, but we'll we'll cover it. We'll, we'll be there. It's, it's hard to know where this. Where, where it ends, and I think, you know, where does this end? I think the long-term thing, is this going to, is there going to be a reckoning in this world around us? You know, were we complacent? Were we able? A lot of questions are being raised right now around uh, the Ukrainian invasion, and obviously the complicit, complicit uh, nature or engaging nature, however you want to describe it, uh, that the world sport is taking uh, to its, its work with Russia and, uh, and Belarus. And I think that that's something that sport you know, is inevitably going to, there will be a point of reckoning when things stabilize and you know, hopefully this conflict uh, ends. Um, but that is a real question that is out there within many, many channels is what have we done to enable and legitimize this current activity? And, and have, have, you, have you played a role? And I think that that's something that I certainly think is going to, to come, come forward. I want to ask if there are any questions uh, from the audience. I have got an awful lot to ask. I can't be. Oh gosh, right, let's go. At the front here, first of all, please. You're nice and close, so go ahead. <laughs> It's a, it's a very it's a great question. You know, it's, it's one you know, as I was as I was doing preparing for this speech, it was an area of you know commercial sport washing in the in the sense of you know saying what it is on the tin. You know, I think one of the one of the aspects you, you see a lot of giving people variety and choice, but also uh, promoting healthy active lifestyles with these events. It's to say we're not going to prevent people from drinking alcohol, we're not going to prevent people from having sugar drinks and so forth. But is it what responsibility can we take in sport to say, okay, we know that there's a risk around around this this choice. How can we use what we're doing in a responsible way? And so you do see uh, a lot of events doing, in addition to uh, aligning themselves with the option of having Budweiser um, or Heineken at their uh, at their venues and so forth as part of the hospitality uh, and commercial viability of the games um, or events, but do it in such a way that you also remind the people you're responsible. And, uh, to, and I think that, that is the balanced proposition. So it does address the risk, but it, it needs to be, you need to do that all the time and not just every four years and not just, you know, there is always this kind of, in your promotions, 
you know, underlining that fact, there is a risk here. <laughs> and that, you know, and that, that you, you, you try to do more, more good than bad, but you don't shy away from the realities. And I think that that's, that's important. If you do too much of anything, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge. But I think it's a very, very good point. You know, I, I don't think there's any good, and sorry for any smokers uh, out there, but I don't think, you know, smoking has a place in sports, <laughs> for example. There's certain goods that just simply are, are, are off limits. Huge, huge, because you know the, the, the lottery funds so much of good sport in so many countries. Yeah. However, what is the you know how do you get the balance right and how do you ensure the ethics, integrity, and compliance standards are, are appropriate and it's not just being used as a, a platform to make more money. Um, I have an earpiece in, so I'm screaming at you at the time, so I'm going to take one more question, that's okay. Uh, yes, first up, right uh, at the end, and then back in. David, thanks very much for your enlightening speech. Um, I want to come back to the point you made towards the end about the day of reckoning. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a direct question about the current geopolitical situation. Is the situation at the Chelsea Football Club an example of sport washing or the consequences of sport washing? The reason why I asked that question is I noted down your definition at the beginning, and it is the deliberate intent to use sport for gain. There is now a standoff between the owner of Chelsea, who now wants his 1.5 billion loan repaid to him. Uh, and then the rest of the definition, while willfully and knowingly being complicit and directly or indirectly engaged in causing harm. The harm is, of course, a cultural and community asset potentially going out of business and through to the main. So I repeat the question, is that sports washing or the consequences of sports washing? You know, I think, it's, I think in, in, in some cases, you know, this, this is a great example. I think that this is, you know, if you, look, you can't look at it just where we are today. It's how did we get, how did we get here? And what were the intentions up front? And I think that I would, so I would, I would, I would really like to understand that, that better in terms of the journey and the decisions and the decision-making process, which, are, which I apologize, that I'm, I'm not as familiar on. However, I would say what we're dealing with is the consequence <laughs> in my first impression um, of this. And, and, I, I, and I really do think that uh, it is, this is where I think that reckoning is going to come to is a, whether we take a, a, a punitive look at this at this point in time, or we're taking a more protective view of this, that we're trying to stabilize and protect uh, the current situation and that that, that day of reckoning will come. I think that this, these are important questions to ask and I think to, to be very direct uh, in terms of an answer, uh, you know, the, the, the latter versus the former <laughs> in terms of uh, it being a consequence. David, I think we can sit here and chat about this all day. Unfortunately, we are up against it time-wise. I'm sure you can help me answer more questions if people uh, approach you. We're going to take a quick break here. I'm sure some of you want to stretch your legs, get tea and coffee, and we'll see you back very shortly after 12 o'clock if we could. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. David Bradford.